first presentation, like I mentioned, is about malware. Malware is something I don't have a huge amount of practical experience in, but I have uh, done a lot of reading on it. And since this is just an introduction, I'll, I didn't really put that on there, but this is an introduction to malware. We're just covering some of the basic topics in malware, so uh, I don't think it's a huge deal that I haven't, I can't tell you how to go reverse engineer the latest virus. So first off, I'll go ahead and describe to you what malware is. It's obviously, it's just short for malicious software. It allows you to compromise a system. It can do one of two things. One, if you've already uh, compromised the system, you can install malware to maintain your access onto that system. The other is it can actually automate the attacking and compromising system, the system. There are five major types of malware, at least in my opinion. You could make arguments for more or for less because there's a lot of overlap between the categories. You've got viruses, worms, backdoors, trojans, and rootkits, and we will hit each of them in turn. Turn. So for an example of some malware, payloads is, is kind of an odd ordering, but it made sense in a longer run, so stick with me. You get things like delivering spyware or adware, of course. Everybody's had that irritating little pop-up at some point that they just downloaded something and forgot to click opt out. There's also botnets. These are where things kind of start to get nasty. Botnets are massive, well, often massive networks of computers. They're connected using backdoors. It can be used for all sorts of nefarious purposes. Denial of service attacks, well, distributed denial of service attacks specifically. Um, there actually, there's been a number apparently that have sent encrypted files out to each computer and they're each given a chunk of a dictionary table to go try to try passwords on it to try to brute force encryption, encrypted files to recover the keys. So they do a lot of stuff. Basically, they do things that you would expect from a distributed network plus some nastier things. Delivering and protecting backdoors to a single machine versus an entire botnet, and uh, also delivering and protecting sniffers to spy on network traffic. Now, there are, of course, other varieties. This is just a few examples. So again, this is kind of an odd order, but I wanted to hit the self-preservation techniques because at the start because it made life a little bit easier for me in crafting this presentation. Most of these techniques actually originated with viruses, but a lot of different types of malware uses them. The first and most obvious is disabling antivirus. Um, antivirus doesn't apply just to viruses, as it turns out. It can it it pretty much detects any type of malicious software that they can write code to detect. Usually the detections, I think I'll talk about this soon, but usually they detect it using either a bit string where they match either with a hash or just looking for flat out exactly a string that is in the uh, virus or malware. The other approach, common approach, is heuristic scanning, which is where they look for behaviors. And then, of course, another attack is modifying other programs to conceal itself. This is like a rootkit. Rootkits just go in and they change software. We'll get into rootkits later, so I'm keeping this high level. So here are the interesting ones, at least in my opinion. The first is polymorphism. This is where the malware changes the appearance of its code by going in and writing equivalent uh, assembly commands. So they, it produces the same output, does the same thing, but it changes the assembly command so it's no longer what can be shown up by an exact detection of string. So this does not actually modify functionality. Now what this usually does is a lot of viruses have an encryption engine, so they encrypt most of the virus, so that it's harder hard to spot that it's a virus. So usually what polymorphism affects is it changes the encryption engine, so it look a little bit differently. Sometimes it also will like, change the key to something else. Um, of course, encryption like that is trivial to break usually, but that's for a different presentation. Then there's metamorphism. This is what I think is really fascinating. This is where the malware actually changes the functionality a little bit. It has effectively the same result, but because it has changed the functionality, it's extremely hard to pick up. You, can't, you have to use really good heuristic scanners that are capable of looking and saying, well, here's not just a behavior of this virus, here's a behavior of this class of malicious software. Metamorphism, sometimes it applies to just the encryption engine, so they will actually change the type of encryption they do a little bit. There's some interesting things to look up there if you're ever interested, but if you're interested about that, come and talk to me and I can tell you some good resources. And other times it actually modifies the, the program itself. Either way, it's much harder to detect than a normal virus is. Uh, any questions? Luke? Has uh, heuristics been proven to be more effective than, uh, than string yeah, Sort of. The problem with heuristics is you're, you're kind of taking a guess. So sometimes you catch things that you shouldn't, and sometimes you miss things that you should. And 
That means what they usually do is they pop up like a warning if they're more aggressive. They'll pop up a warning to the user. And if you guys are used to like the Windows 7 or Windows Vista access control box that pops up and it says, do you want to allow access? Most people just click yes. They just automatically click yes. So once you've got so many of those boxes that come up to ask the user for input, they tend to just get ignored, at which point they can lose functionality. But yes, in general, I would say probably they are more effective. But an argument can be made either way. Use both is what it basically boils down to. Because the matching a bit string will get it every time if it can do that. Every time. Um, what's it trying to match? Like what type of bit string? Or like... There's a different, a bunch of different ways. One of the most common, as far as I'm aware, is you look for strings, like ASCII strings, in the virus. So not as much anymore, I think, but some of the old ones especially like to deliver messages. But even without that, you can usually still find some strings. If nothing else, you can look for function calls. Um, but of course, once you get into function calls, unless they're really unusual ones, which in Windows at least there are, in the native API, I believe it's still almost entirely undocumented, at least by Microsoft. So there are some very rarely used function calls. Um, the other thing... So like when you look for a big string, like you were mentioning earlier about how like, you get the pop-up message that says a virus has been has been computer, and it might not be a legitimate uh, virus, but it's like, could it search for that type of, let's say, detect fires, detect like, So that was like, um, what I was talking about with the boxes, the dialog boxes with the heuristic scanners. Uh, I mean, okay, they say virus detected on bit strings, but bit strings yeah. tend to be pretty exact. Okay. Um, there's not a lot of room for error. Uh, the other thing they'll do is they'll like hash the virus code, and then you just go hash new code like viruses and see if they've changed. Um, I think I've got, slides on defenses. So we'll talk about it soon. Yeah. If you have questions after you see the defenses on viruses, go ahead and ask me again. Um, but I'm just because yeah. I don't want to have to end up going over things. So what is a virus? Um, it's actually self-replicating malicious code. It copies itself to other locations on the system. Generally, you'll see it to files. It can also go to like boot sectors. Um, the interesting thing about virus is a little bit of history is it actually did come from the fact that somebody was looking at machine code and they realized, hey, this is kind of like a living organism. And so there's certain machine code you can write it that is like the, a living organism. And eventually, or within a few years of that type of talk, somebody turned, coined the term virus for uh, talking about self-replicating malicious code. Now, the distinguishing factor that distinguishes a virus from other self-replicating code is that it requires, it, or generally requires, human interaction to go between computer systems. And I say that because a worm is like a virus, but we'll get into that in a moment. Of course, there is the option for like a virus. If you've got file shares, then you might be able to spread without very much human interaction just because you can go across a network. So there are always exceptions like that. But in general, a file either has to be downloaded or you have to uh, take it on your, used to be floppy, now it's zip drives. Sorry, not zip drives. Flash drives, I've never said that before. Um, where did that come from? Anyway, the original viruses were basically practical jokes, but they soon became nefarious. Uh, I think I've got a little slide on the, a couple of viruses from history, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there's a number of different propagation techniques, of course. We talked about some of the defenses. Some of these kind of merge in with that, but I, I talked about this separately. So most viruses, they spread by hiding within files and then running when the file is open. They can hide within that file with prepending, appending, or modifying the host to just flat out change at an arbitrary point. A lot of them hide within executables. So if you do that, you can flat out insert yourself into the assembly code at a random point, rewrite all the pointers within it, and uh, off you go. Another thing is taking advantage of file system structures. Now the interesting thing here, uh, I don't know if anybody is aware of this, but on the NTFS file storage system, so that's what you've got when you format a disk in Windows usually is NTFS. It, it has what's called an ADS, an alternate data stream. Now what these are, these are features that are not used at all within Windows, amusingly. Um, but it allows you to have content that is an associate with a different stream, but it is part of the same file. And the thing about alternate data streams is from Windows you cannot see them at all. It does not show up as increasing the size of the file. It does not show up when you double click on the file to run it, there is no way to see it without using a special tool. And so that's a, that was a, and still is a common way to hide your virus. Um, 
I haven't actually seen anything outside of malware use alternate data streams, but I think they're a really interesting idea. But obviously, because a lot of tools when you're trying to detect a virus, check to see if the size of a file has changed, or even if the hash has changed, um, unless your hash or your file size checker goes into the alternate data stream and checks it, you have no way of knowing it's there. Uh, anyway, some of them insert themselves into boot sectors. This allows them to actually insert themselves into the operating system as it boots. So this is really nasty, but you don't see this as often anymore. Um, I'm not sure, well, I guess I do know why. It's because we no longer have the same hardware base that we used to, which makes it harder to make boot viruses, I suspect. I could be wrong. Anyway, once, in, once a boot virus has infected a file, or once it's infected a boot uh, sector, it will either infect files, because some of them have multiple ways of hiding and infecting files, uh, or it will infect the boot sectors of other disks. This doesn't happen as often as much anymore also, I guess, because now that we don't use floppy drives, you would, for instance, you couldn't really infect the boot sector of a CD unless you got really lucky. Let's put it that way. Now, of course, USB drives you could, but most computers are not configured to boot off USB by default, so I would imagine that also explains why they've fallen by the wayside in addition to the hardware techniques. Now, are there any questions here? So, uh, essentially, what I'm thinking is the reason why they might have fallen by the wayside is because it is so easy for users to change their boot sector. Uh, I mean, they get, my, my boot sector gets reformatted any time I reformat my operating system. Uh, yeah, but most people don't reformat their operating system. What is important is that computers used to default to boot off floppy, and they don't do that anymore. They default to boot off hard drive now. That's true. And I'm guessing that would be the main reason. But like I said, there may also be hardware interactions. So here's some of the defenses. Oops, I already talked about most of them. There's bit, bit string matching, there's heuristic scanning, and finally there's integrity checks. These are actually the best way to detect viruses and other malware. If you do an integrity check, so you like take, say, a, a checksum, well, a cryptographic hash, preferably, of a clean configuration, and then compare it to a later configuration uh, that has been infected, it's really hard to infect. Unfortunately, that means you have to update your checksum every stinking time you want to change a file, change anything. You can also, of course, do that on a file-by-file -file basis. Now, when you get into rootkits, this gets harder to use anyway. There's system hard hardening. Um, there's a whole bunch to this, but at a simple level, it's using non-admin users for regular use and using built-in defenses. Honestly, that's a whole other presentation, and that's why I didn't go into detail on it. It just would take too long. Um, and then, of course, this is a big one, too, user education. This is big all over the place in security. If your users do something stupid, <laughs> There's not much you can do to prevent your system from getting compromised. You have to take the time to train your developers, your um, end users, anybody who's involved in your organization, whether you be a, whether you're a coding organization or not. At the very, you're, you're sure to have IT infrastructure. They need to understand how to use computers securely. And quite frankly, you're probably going to have to refresh that education every few years. Now, are there any questions, John? I. Uh, no. You scan for the virus signature. Usually, you don't scan and hide the security file. I think it kind of depends on what they're scanning for, but usually no. Usually, they just scan for this. Yeah. Usually, what you're going to look for is like, uh, well, what? Oh, let me let me ask you a question because I may have misunderstood what you said. When you say scan the entire executable, you mean the, the host executable, or do you mean the virus executable? You scan for the virus signature. Usually, you don't scan and Ah, you have to scan the entire executable depending on the virus you're searching for. Right, but then, well, then it will just slow down the slow down antivirus program. And, 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 and there's a big trade-off on antiviruses as far as that goes. Usually, what it is is they will look for common locations when you download a file. Well, usually when you download a file, they do a full check. But when they're just doing random careful updates. And then you do a full scan, and I believe those usually do more in depth. See, the thing is, is although a lot of viruses, they go into just a certain place, like the header, they re readjust, they append or prepend, like I said. Uh, you get one, I think I talk about it a little bit, uh, like there's one called Zemist by a Russian writer called Zombie. It's ridiculous. He goes in and at a random point, splits apart the code basically, rewrites all the pointers so that they will go across through, give him execution and out. And it's really hard to detect. Now, the downside of writing a virus like that is sometimes if you randomize your point, you, uh, it never can take control. It never gets control 
Uh, so it never actually executes. The, the thing that had me confused for a second is uh, I started to think you were talking about a dropper. And a dropper, I don't actually mention this anywhere in here, so I'll tell you about it now. A dropper is a initial form that a virus or a worm comes in. It's how you deploy that virus or worm for the first time. It's just like a little executable. You drop it onto the system, and after that it takes over. So that's just first-generation virus or a worm. Any other questions? All right, so here's a couple examples I've got. Most of these are somewhat old because... The book I read on viruses was from 2006, but there hasn't actually been that much of interest in the past few years. So the first one here is not actually a virus. This is called Pervade. It was a UNIVAT program from the 70s. It's the first recorded self-replicating program. That's why I talked about it. Um, Pervade copied a game called Animal, which I think was kind of like 20 questions, and it copied it basically to every directory on the computer because the guy who wrote it got tired of giving it to other users who asked for it. Um, so he didn't consider it malware. It couldn't actually spread beyond that one computer because it depended on special macros that were included on that UNIVAC computer. Sorry, I don't remember where that UNIVAC computer was. So uh, it, it's just it's an interesting little note because that's where the theory first come, came from. Before then, there's no recorded instance of somebody writing a self-replicating program. Uh, the next was Elk Cloner. This is pretty much the first famous virus. There were a couple others around the time. This was written by a high school student in 82. Uh, what it did was it infected the boot sector of a floppy of an Apple II computer, and then it gave a poem which was not particularly good. So every time a floppy got inserted into an Apple II, it could be infected. This poem, it, I mean, the poem was literally the only malicious thing. Every, it was like, I want to say it was 60, but I think it was less than that on the other hand. So it, it would just display that poem periodically. Yeah, he used to like his high school teacher, but his high school teacher wasn't happy with him after this, apparently. And then there's Z-Mist. I mentioned that. Z-Mist I mentioned because it's got this insanely sophisticated metamorphic engine. It's absolutely fascinating to read about, and if you're interested in it, come talk to me one of these days. Is that guy? He's a, it's the handle for a Russian virus writer, yeah. It's someone who hasn't been apprehended. There's a lot of those, actually, as it turns out. It's hard to catch people, especially because most of them are in either Eastern Europe or Russia, and honestly, a lot of the legal systems there don't care right now. So, um, But even in anywhere else, unless you are stupid enough to put something that makes you easy to trace, the only real point of risk is when you first do a dropper. Um, that's traceable, and if you're trying to profit from this somehow, you're probably connecting back to yourself, so it's possible to trace back there. And that's really the only ways to deal with it. So any other questions? Uh, so worms. Uh, I mentioned these a little bit. A worm is kind of like a file-infecting virus, uh, but instead of infecting files, it infects systems. Uh, usually it doesn't require human invention to spread, with the exception of um, sending out mass emails, which often require you to click on them, although some versions of Outlook would automatically run anything that was attached to an email that was even previewed, and so bam. Um, so they require social engineering. Basically, what a worm does is it takes an exploit that a hacker has already made, and instead of that hacker having to go and compromise every system individually, this worm basically allows you to automate this attack. So it's kind of a big deal because suddenly you have the ability to just go and uh, compromise hundreds or even thousands of systems. So there's five components of a worm. The warhead, this contains the actual exploit that allows the worm to break into a system. I won't go into detail on exploits right now because hopefully we'll be able to get into detail of them, of them in the near future. Um, propagation engine, this is what actually downloads the test, the rest of the worm code onto the victim system. Oops. It downloads the rest of the code. It can do this in a number of different ways. If you're propagating across an internet with file shares, you might just download them there. Most of them actually upload back to the creator's website and download the code from there. Uh, they can also open an FTP connection or something along those lines, a connection back to the original computer that was hosting them before they spread and transfer the code that way. Then there's target selection. This is a mechanism which generates the data to go pick new victims. So basically this is going to generate IP addresses. They do it in a few different ways. One of them is just flat out make it random. Another one is here's a chunk of IP addresses. Another is what's my current IP address? Okay, I'm going to spread to computers in this area, and then after I've done that, I'll start spreading to other ones uh, outside this immediate area. Basically, they're looking to get as many computers infected as they can, so you want to spread locally to save time and then spread outwards from there. Scanning engine, 
This uses the data from the target selection to actually pick the victims. And then finally, the payload, this runs whatever the creator wants on the target. So you package a payload, it can be pretty much any number of things. Oftentimes, it's going to be a backdoor or a botnet, which is, again, kind of a backdoor. But anyway, questions? So defenses, these are really similar to viruses, but in addition to that, firewalls, both at the individual computer level and network levels. This is nice because if, it's, if that exploit is running on a service that you don't use, then that virus probably won't be able to run the exploit. Um, intrusion detection systems, these really help out because if all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of activity on an unusual port or there's something odd about the activity, then you begin to think you're under attack. So an intrusion detection can often detect a worm. Some of them, I believe, I haven't played much with intrusion detection systems, so I really don't know, but some of them can probably identify what worm it is for you as it's doing it. That's just basically scanning the code and saying, oh, hey, this is a such and such worm. And then finally, keep patches up to date to keep the exploits from working. This is pretty much something I hope everybody knows. Do your updates. <laughs> as soon as they're pending, if they're critical security updates, you should go ahead and update your system, unless you're on a production server, in which case you may use a test server and take a while anyway. Um, that's a special case, in which case you're probably hardening. Any questions here? I think I've got a little bit, yeah, a few examples. So the first one is the Morris worm. This was, when I say the first one, it is the first one. It was uh, also called the Internet Worm. It happened in 88. It only infected Unix machines, but since at the time, there were a lot of Unix machines connected to the Internet compared to uh, Windows computers, since Windows wasn't around yet, so DOS computers, which didn't really do much in the way of networking, Anyway, it was estimated to compromise 10% of the Internet uh, at, at that time. So that was only about 6,000 machines, so that's not as impressive as it might sound. However, it was kind of a big deal considering the Internet was still new at the time, and it kind of freaked people out. Then you have about 10 years where there are only a few worms, and none of them are really major before another big one hits. The next big one is called Melissa. This was in 99. It got to Windows through Outlook. I want to say that this is one of those that was able to exploit the whole preview issue, uh, which, like I said, I mean, at the time, you didn't actually have to open the email. You could click preview. If it had JavaScript in it, it would run the JavaScript, and it could run its code. HTML email, I don't understand why we're so obsessed with Wait, what's, what's the preview on email? So, not all of them have it. Do you use an email client? I mean, most people don't anymore. No. I mean, I did when I was, like, 10 years old. <laughs> I use Thunderbird. I like Thunderbird. Uh, so the preview, to open an email, normally you would like say double click in Outlook. And this has changed somewhat because you usually don't need to open it up in its own window anymore. The preview pane is so good now that, but the preview will just be like a little sample of the text. More so, more than what you get in Gmail where it's just the line. Yeah, say, yeah. Sorry, sorry. A little bit more yeah, that. it'll actually go execute like the HTML, which is where the problem okay. comes in. There's JavaScript, it executes JavaScript, it infects it, it's really stupid. I, I, there's no reason to have JavaScript in emails. I'm sorry. I don't even like sending HTML emails. I like text emails personally. I don't see the point. Okay, it's nice to be able to bold, but other than that. You wanted to have like a little animation. Don't. Not in the email. Just don't. It's called an attachment. Yeah. Aside from that, you could do a GIF, which doesn't require JavaScript to do that. So it depends on what you want. But. Uh, most of the time, if you look stuff like that, you click on an external link, which you really shouldn't do if you don't know what's going on. Never mind. I just don't. Um, but Outlook was automatically running the previews pretty much. Yeah, I think they finally fixed that, but it took a while. In fact, I'm pretty sure they finally fixed that. Code Red, this was a big one. Some, some of you may remember this happening. I remember when it was happening. Um, and since I was only, what, seven, eight, something like that, that's more impressive than it sounds. Anyway, it attacked MS Windows versus, versus via IIS. IIS, by the way, I don't know if everybody knows this, is Internet. Microsoft Anybody know? Web it's server. the Microsoft Web Server that really sucks. Uh, not that I'm opinionated or anything, but it sucks. Anyway, it compromised about 250 systems in nine hours. Uh, its payload was a DDoS attack on the whitehouse.gov. So this was not just a, can I write a worm and see how well it does? Which, by the way, the Morris worm was. No, this was a, we're trying to attack someone and we're really writing good code. Now, I was originally going to stop here, but I decided to include in media, which I don't actually know if there is a way to spell that, but you'll notice if you read it backwards, it's admin, which is, it's assumed where the name came from. Uh, anyway, this happened the same year as Code Red. 
It happened just after 9-11, so at the time there was actually some concern that this was a new phase of terrorism. It, now, the interesting thing about NVIDIA, aside from what I just said about 9-11, is it used 12 different exploits. This is the first known multi-exploit worm. So basically that means, oh, this approach didn't work, I'll try this approach. This approach still didn't work, I'll try another one. Uh, it also could do file infection, so it basically could act as a virus as well that just straight up infected files and executables and such. So NVIDIA was nasty. There have been nastier ones, but these ones are of historical interest. Questions here? Was that um, designed to target like terrorists or by a government institution? Or do they know? I don't think they really know. Some of the worms, they never really figure out what they're doing. I mean, if you followed, what was it? Um, it wasn't fire. It was one that came before. Stuxnet. Oh. It took them forever to figure out what that was doing. And the only reason they figured it out was because it had infected everything. Isn't that a multi-exploit? Oh, almost certainly. Almost certainly. Uh, Stutnex is the one that everybody is convinced that it had to have been written by government, although I think it probably was based on what its payload was, if you go look at some of the history of viruses and worms. If you go look at the history of some of viruses and worms, uh, you get collaborations of virus writers that do some insanely complex things. There's at least one virus out there that actually includes support for uh, extensions as well as everything else. Which I, plugins, sorry, plugins. Which I think is hilarious. It's like I'm gonna write a virus in the worm that includes plugins because every program needs to be have a pluggable architecture. I I just I love it. Uh, any other questions? Code red is a reference Given that code red is commonly applied in the lab, I don't know. Probably not. Uh, there was actually Code Red 2, if anyone is interested. It happened, I want to say, within a year. And it used the same exploit plus a couple other ones. It used really similar code. It had a different objective. I don't remember what that was off the top of my head. But they think that it was actually somebody was able to either get the source code or just modify the existing assembly and make a new attack with it. And that, by the way, was the problem with Stuxnet, if anyone was wondering. If it was indeed made by a government, then they basically handed everybody a great tool for infecting systems. And that's the problem, yeah. Well, that and the fact it got out of hand, because I don't know if everybody's familiar with Stuxnet, and I think it was Flame or Fire, I don't remember. They were targeting the Iranian nuclear program. It's really interesting because they infected Windows computers that were controlling, it's not custom equipment, I can't remember the manufacturer name, but it's equipment that is used for industrial purposes. It's kind of like a microcontroller, but it's scaled way, way up. So this is something that uses a different architecture than your regular PC. So they actually had intimate knowledge. They had, uh, well, the reason why they're pretty sure it's the U.S. government was involved is because the U.S. government had managed to get hold of some uh, uranium processing materials that were the same make as what Iran had. And they got that during the whole Libyan thing that was going on. So as it turns out, the U.S. probably had the capability to replicate what Iran was doing and thus target it. Sorry, that wasn't just the standard version of XP. What do you mean? Like you said, it would oh, be... Oh, just... Stuxnet targeted... Stuxnet infected XP. Right. But it was targeted to infect XP machines in the Iranian facility mm -hmm. that would... Uh, that were controlling other computers that were not standard computer PCs. Right. The interesting thing is, too, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the term air gap. What that means is you've got a network that is entirely separated from every other network. And so the Iranian facility was air gas, except for USB drives. <laughs> so apparently someone took in an infected USB drive and that's how they got infected with Stuxnet and Flame. Oh yeah, nobody thinks of it, do they? I mean, how many systems do we know of that are air gas, but you can probably take in a CD or a USB drive? You should literally be unplugging the USB drives and filling them with epoxy, in my opinion. Uh, you just, if you want to be air gapped, if you want to be secure, you do not want your employees to be able to easily bring stuff into the network. So, uh, unfortunately, that's something a lot of organizations miss. All right, so backdoors. A backdoor, that's a, all that really is is a, pro, a program that allows an attacker to get unauthorized access to a system. So a local backdoor, the attacker has to be physically present to use the backdoor, and remote backdoors, they can reach it across a network computer. Now, the, the thing about backdoors is they usually, well, they, they never are 
install it with an exploit. You could use them as a payload to a worm, but basically, in the most simple case, this is no longer about exploiting a computer. This is about maintaining access to a computer. So you literally, you, you've hacked into a machine, you install a backdoor, and now you have access to that machine until it either gets removed or something happens to disable that backdoor. Uh, so many backdoors are implemented with Netcat, the Netcat utility. Um, they, if you use the proper command line to arguments for Netcat, you can get command line access to the system shell. Now, that work, this can work in both Windows and Linux, but in Windows, you have to install a Netcat utility, and Linux is often there. However, as we were discovering when we were testing the demo, even in Linux, you have to go get a specific Netcat package to use this particular approach because they no longer come with the executable uh, command line switch enabled. Now, I, I'd like to take a moment to describe what Netcat is. Netcat literally allows you to connect over any socket of either TCP or UDP and just flat out send data with no formatting across the network. So that's why it's used a lot, because it's really low profile and you can do anything you want. Netcat is used for other things as well, both legitimate and malicious. It's, uh, I've heard it be called the Swiss Army knife of uh, network tools. In addition to using Netcat, an attacker could just fly out and install a VNC server. Now the thing to keep in mind is I can install a VNC server, but I can do things to hide it. I can, if nothing else, flat out just change the name so that it doesn't show up as VNC server on your hard drive and it doesn't show up as VNC server in the process list. And the downside with, the, with most VNC servers is that they uh, require, uh, they only access a single session, so they will actually take control from the user, so it becomes really obvious if an attacker is using a basic VNC server because suddenly your mouse is moving or your cursor is moving of its own accord, keystrokes are being entered. Whereas using Netcat, it's not visible to the user. However, like I said, there's more sophisticated ways of doing both these things. These are just the really simple ones. So defenses against backdoors, there's again system hardening, there's of course antivirus, I didn't even list that here. Basically the same techniques as in both um, viruses and worms. In addition, specifically, a lot of firewalls, they only block incoming ports by default. Now, this has started to change because I think Windows, at least now, allows you to make outgoing blocking connections. It didn't even used to do that on XP, at least not in the first two service packs. So the reason why you need to block outgoing connections comes up in just a moment. But first, are there any questions? Um, so there are some countermeasures to those defenses. Uh, one is just flat out disable the firewall. This is highly obvious. You wouldn't really want to do this. Another one is to hide the port usage and process activity. We'll, we'll come back into more detail on how you do that with, when we hit rootkits. Um, then there's what's called shoveling a connection. This is where it gets interesting, and this is where it applies to outgoing firewalls. Shoveling a connection, instead of once I've installed that back door, instead of my connecting to you, I actually have the victim machine connect back to my machine. Um, so that gets me around an incoming firewall with no problem. So those were really common for a while. That's probably dropped off now that outgoing firewalls are more common. And then there's another really interesting one, which is where instead of acting like a normal program and sitting on the TCP slash uh, IP stack or on top of UDP stack, you actually sniff what the network traffic directly. And this allows a couple things. Is One, this means you don't have to rely on ports anymore. You can change ports randomly, just prefix a command, or a, a, a character sequence that makes that TCP packet invalid to the TV, TCP slash IP stack so that it doesn't get processed, but you still catch it and you execute that command. It also means that on the right network configuration or if you've done other attacks to compromise the system, like um, uh, art poisoning, which if anybody's interested in art poisoning, it all that does is it at a really low level, it allows me to change what IP address is pointing to what MAC address. And because the Ethernet protocol has no defenses against that uh, in its usual configuration, there's nothing you can do. Now, like I said, if anyone's interested in that now, you can come talk to me. That's probably going to come up once we hit a pen testing presentation. Hopefully we can do a demo. Hopefully we can do exercises, but we'll see. Um, anyway, and finally where it gets... Give me just a second. Finally, what I thought was really interesting is using IMCP commands... ICMP, sorry commands to ping, and con to, like ping, like the command ping to control that door. Now that's internet control message protocol. So these are commands that they don't, they aren't as visible to the normal operating system as most commands or as most packets. I mean, they are visible in theory, but you, they don't go up the, the regular stacks. They're usually responded to at a really low level. 
So I could literally sniff the incoming ICMP traffic and use it to send commands. And those are effectively invisible. And because, again, protocols like this were invented, were created so long ago that they didn't have security built in, there's just, there's no sanity checks on ping. So you can put as much as you want in a ping packet. Well, there are some restrictions just because eventually it'll time out, but you can put a lot in a ping packet and there's nothing that's going to check to make sure that there's nothing in there. Now, of course, an intrusion detection system might, you might have a firewall that scans like that. So what I'm saying here is by default systems don't check that. Now, if you had a question. Yeah, um, packet sniffing, things like that would need to be on some kind of a router or a machine that's um, routing packets. So, how would, how would a node? So, so a node, if you're sending traffic to that node, you can sit on that node and sniff the traffic anyway. And if I make it so that those pallets are invalid, so they get rejected by the TCP slash IP stack, then I'll never see them as the end user. Okay. But the sniffing program is sitting below that stack. It's sniffing all network traffic. So it's circumventing the usual process for getting information from the network up into the operating system. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's only interested in, in that node. It's not interested in any information on the network or other. Well, you can compromise the network so that you can get information from other nodes. And those techniques, uh, I mean, some backdoors and some Trojans do use sniffers as the um, attack vector. Um, again, we'll probably get into more detail on that so at some point, but because I can effectively reroute traffic, without anybody knowing, I can compromise a regular node with on an intranet, not, it, it can only be with on an intranet because of how ARP works. It does not resolve within the, within the internet, only with behind the same router. I can usually get that stuff. Also, are you familiar with the distinction between a hub and a switch? Yes. So you, didn't, you know that a hub... I'm, I'm assuming that you don't have any hubs. So a lot of yeah, organizations, hub. organizations with legacy hardware, yeah, they're using hubs. I don't know, is any, does everybody else know what a hub is? No? Okay, so I, I had a feeling. So a hub, every, every packet that is sent into a hub is sent out on all ports. A switch, it builds up a table, a listing, and it says, okay, on this port, there's this MAC address. And I know that this MAC address is associated with this IP address. Technically, it doesn't have to do that. Anyway, so I'm going to send this data on this one port so it connects only to that particular node. Does that make sense? So if, if you're on a hub, in other words, you can see everybody's traffic that is on that hub. Okay. Because it broadcasts to everyone. They're bad for other reasons. They're really inefficient for almost every application at this point. <laughs> but if you built a if you built an infrastructure twenty years ago, you probably used a hub. And some organizations still have twenty year old computing infrastructures. So so I talked about Netcat, how it lets you transfer unprocessed data between computers. You can use either UDP or TCP. By the way, does everyone know what UDP and TCP is? Okay, it looks like it. So an attacker... I'm a little confused about what the purpose of a socket is. I mean, like, uh, I've used them in, let's say, one of the classes here. At all. So having taken a networking class, I can look at one of you, hopefully, quickly explain the distinction. A socket is a purely logical um, data structure. Okay. What it does is it allows me to track what application is sending what data and what application is listening for what data. So I assign it's like two to the sixteen sockets. I have, those are available, and I can either pick depending on what I am. Well, usually what it is if I'm a server, so I'm receiving data, I pick a socket to listen to. So SSH picks twenty-two, or you can set it to something else. As a sender, I am assigned a socket number or a port number, and that is, uh, I include that information when I send my packet. Well, actually, I don't because the TCPI stack handles all that for me. Um, that data is included so that when the server responds to me, it, I still have that number so I know as the TCPI P stack, I know what to send it to, or the UDP stack. So you would have, let's say, that TCP stack installed on the client. Oh yeah, it, it, that would be, okay. it comes with every modern computing system. So, okay. and, and the same thing with UDP. You wouldn't use TCP like that wouldn't be used in networking. That would be UDP stuff. Um, in networking, what do you mean when you I say mean, networking? Like in a game, what in networking? Where uh, it really depends on what type of game it is. What what basically? 
in, 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 its most, um, in its most basic form. So TCP basically guarantees the delivery of a packet. So when I send a packet, I sit there and I wait to make sure that you have acknowledged the receipt. Anyway, you get what I mean. Um, UDP, I just send the packet and I hope. Right. So UDP is good for things where it doesn't matter if a little bit is dropped. So say videos, right? If a single uh, packet gets dropped in the video, who cares? You won't notice it. The human eye can't notice it. Uh, TCP is used for stuff where the data needs to remain the same. So if instance, for instance, I was sending you some text, I want to use TCP so that we didn't lose any text and it didn't get garbled. Um, so that, that's literally the only distinction. All right, so what he's going to run, I'll go ahead and break it down for everyone. What he's going to run is this anti, anti l p port dash e slash bin slash sh. Now, nc is just ncat, you probably guessed that. Dash l, that means listen. Uh, which means it'll be basically the server side. Dash P, that just specifies the port. Dash E, uh, that's for dash, for execute. And then slash bin slash sh is the Linux shell. So if you run that command, with yeah. what port did you use? 1234. One, two, three, four. So what I'll run in just a second is NC, and then I'll run his IP, which is 192.168.1.5. Yeah. And then I'll run the, put the port 1234, and we should be able to establish a connection. It shows it is listening, right? Yeah. All right. So let me pull that over here. And then it's just going to take me a moment. One nine, caps lock is on. One, base. 192.168.1.5. One, and then it was 1234, right? 1234. Three, four. All right, so that <clears throat> you see, there's no output, and that's expected. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what he's got running. Nothing in that directory. Oh, look, there is now. <laughs> so I'll just pretend that he had some. Uh, whoops, my hand flipped that time. I'll pretend that he already has these files there. He's got these very secret files. He doesn't want anyone to read them. He doesn't want anyone to read them. Well, there's no text to them yet. As it turns out, he's not very industrious, but we'll take a look anyway. Oh, I forgot. Tab complete does not work over this. So nothing in him, like I said. You know, this enterprising mad scientist genius, whatever. He hasn't gotten very far yet, but we're gonna put we're gonna put a dent in his plans, aren't we? Very secret. Files. And I did it again. I see What? I get. I see your error output. Oh yeah, you would. You would. It, it doesn't. So it doesn't transmit. Uh, I can't remember the exact details of how it's set up, but at least on um, Unix systems, it does not transmit back some of the responses because they're done through, I believe, a different process. So like, where you would normally have the prompt, that doesn't show up. So you just have to know what you need to type. Now what happens on Linux, although on Windows you can use an extra switch that makes it persistent, is, so I'm ready to disconnect, I'm going to just hit Control C. Now if I were to try to run this again, I can't connect. So uh, on Windows there's an uppercase, there's a different version on Windows that lets it be persistent. That gives, that's dash uppercase L, but on Linux there is no such version of that. So basically what happens is you only get one connection. So if you're an attacker, you either need to put a wrapper or a modified version of Netcat on their system, or else you need to do whatever you want to do while you're installed. How come you only have one connection? So what? How come you only have one connection? How come you can have a connection? Well, that's what I was just trying to explain. Um, basically what happens is, just the way Netcat works, um, with this, um, on his side, that dash L, Okay. It says basically it only gives you one shot. After it's connected once, it stops listening, it turns off. Uh, in Windows, like I said, uppercase L, it's persistent. And you can write, you can either modify it, I believe modified versions do just for Linux, or you can just write a little wrapper that says, if Netcat's disabled, turn it back on. Who in the world would release the setup on the screen outside Say it again? I mean, who in the world would do, do something like that? Mm -hmm. Set up a pod listening 
Oh, so yeah. If if I mean normally normally he wouldn't do that, right? He wouldn't do that, right? But let's say that I've got an exploit. Either I put it either on a worm or I do it manually. I run some code, uh, some shell code. I, I inject some code into the uh, using like a Stack Overflow exploit. I inject some code. I run netcat attached to that, yeah, attached to the shell. Suddenly I have access, and I know what port it's on. And that's why, now, I, I, obviously, no one would do that on purpose. Now there is also there are also Trojans. So sometimes we just are stupid, and we download something we probably shouldn't have, or even worse, a legitimate software site got compromised. And the distribution method got uh, infected with something like this. And so this just runs in the background. And this is a really simple backdoor. That's why I, I demonstrated this. If this had been a nastier one, we haven't got our ethics stuff in place yet, so I wouldn't have demonstrated it. But this is so easy to figure out how to do, and it, it's worthless without, like, the shell code. I didn't worry about it. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, normally, I, I mean, who would be stupid enough to run that? But... Um, <laughs> And you'll notice I did not want to uh, run it over the wireless because there's always the risk that someone's sitting there with like NMAP scanning the network and uh, they just happen to hit it at the right time and they find there's an open port and they try it with NetCat and bam, they've got access to the system. <laughs> uh, although that probably wouldn't have worked this time, but anyway. Uh, and like I said, there's another way to make NetCat shovel a connection. I don't remember that command off the top of my head and we're already over time, so... Uh, I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to try to go through the rest of this quicker, too, for that matter. Any questions? So here is what I use uh, Wireshark, which does the network sniffing. The red text is sent by the attacker. The blue text is uh, sent by the victim in response. Uh, so then there are Trojans. What's a Trojan? It's a piece of malware that's disguised as trusted software. Sometimes it's entirely fake software that appears legitimate. Some variations, they simply attack legitimate software and they embed malware within it. Uh, they, Trojans are often backdoors, um, embedding basically what we just showed there, something along those lines. Questions? So, some defenses against Trojans, basically the same thing. All the defenses for viruses and worms are good, uh, especially, we talked about integrity checks, but these are especially good for Trojans. Um, hashes and checksums are really good because, well, if you download the software, for instance, if there's a hash checksum that you get from a different channel, because otherwise it's probably just been recalculated by the attacker, then you can attempt to verify that your software has not been modified. Even better is using a digital signature. I don't know if anyone's familiar with those, but we, there's a cryptography presentation next week, so if you're interested enough to learn about digital signatures, we'll go into detail there. But basically, unless somebody has, as long as you can trust the author's signing key, you, you can be fairly certain that it hasn't been tampered with. So what's a rootkit? It's a form of Trojan that just flat out replaces portions of the kernel or the actual operating system. This lets it hide itself and other uh, other files and processes that are being used by the attacker, and it's used to maintain access to a compromised system. So a rootkit would often be used with a backdoor as well. Questions? Uh, so what's a user mode rootkit? Well, like I said, there are kind of two different levels, kernel and uh, user mode. User mode, uh, I don't know how familiar people are with computer architecture, but a CPU actually has multiple rings, they're called. Uh, user mode is ring three, kernel mode is ring zero, I believe. And you have to have a special permission, and it actually takes time to switch between the two different processes. They actually run in separate sections of memory, and it's just a low-level protection mechanism that doesn't work very well for the most part. But it, well, it prevents, say, a drive-by attack sort of thing. Somebody just looking to get lucky, they can't do it. So it, present, it prevents attackers who are not determined, shall we say. And it, it, it makes it harder even, yeah, it makes it harder to attack. Anyway, so the user mode only replaces user-level programs. Uh, they can conceal files, ports, and other things from the user. So an example of replacing a program, an obvious one would be, uh, the, well, an obvious replacement program would be LS, right? So I take LS, I either rewrite it entirely, inject malicious code into it, or put a wrapper around it that calls it but filters its output. And at this point, I can, say, hide the file called backdoor. Or I can modify a, a program a process that lets me see what ports are being used. They can also employ techniques like modifying the file system, so this goes back to the ADS thing I mentioned before, or they can inject themselves into memory called, through API hooking, which is done in Windows, but that's, we don't have a lot of time. Were there any questions? So kernel mode rootkits, these are just the counterpart. 
these go modify the kernel of the operating system. The kernel of the operating system is basically the heart of the operating system. All hardware access goes through the kernel, which means that if you can control the kernel, you control the system. This basically gives the attacker full control over anything they want. If it's well written and designed, you pretty much can't detect it because uh, even if I have a program that hasn't been compromised at the user mode level, if it goes looking for a list of ports, it has to talk to the kernel to get those ports, and I can simply hide those ports from you at the kernel level. So it's really nasty. They're really similar in actual usage to a user mode kernel. They're just far nastier. So the defenses, they're pretty similar. So the main defense is just once you've detected them, you reinstall. Uh, you have more flexibility if you have a lot of experience. Windows, it's a bit harder to fix at all because Windows is honestly, in my opinion, harder to repair. But on a Unix system, you've got a better shot at repairing it, but honestly, it's safer just to reinstall it altogether. Of course, the other defense is the same as what we've discussed before. What you really want to do is make sure it never gets on your system. Um, so just use the antivirus, use stuff like that to make sure it never hits your system. How, what's the best way to detect a user mode rootkit? Use a CD with statically linked tools. That way, you're not linking out to any libraries that they may have modified, and you're not using the tools that they may have modified. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for kernel mode because, like I said, even those statically linked tools have to call the kernel. So for kernel mode, you literally you reboot off a CD, and the reason why you want to reboot off a CD is because as long as you know it was clean when you burned it, it can't get infected by anything. There's a fair number of Linux Live CDs designed for detecting things like this. For both, both types, those tools, you're usually going to use integrity checkers. There is one other type of tool used for detecting a rootkit while you're running. It basically does sanity checks. So for instance, it might start a sniffer, and if sniffers are being hidden, hidden, it will say, well, I've started a sniffer, and you told me there was no sniffer running, so obviously there's a rootkit. Questions? So here's what we get into. Uh, so combo malware, that's where you combine two or more types of malware to make something bigger and nastier. This is what I keep on going back to with the worm. I might use a worm to infect a whole bunch of computers with a back door, and with that back door, I can create a botnet and get enough botnets, and I can do an awful lot of things. And in addition to that, I might add another element with a rootkit to hide that back door and botnet from the admin of the system. Any questions? So in conclusion, Malware is used for maintaining access to a machine and gaining it in the first place in some cases. Defenses are basically harden your system, detect it with antivirus, use user education, and of course using intrusion detection systems. And here are a few sources that I use. So these are all fairly well written. This last one is a bit of a tough read and it's really more of a history in my opinion, although it does talk about some of the actual techniques used for computer virus research.